Well, you guys were sleeping on the job. We've been breaking our back to get the job done. Here's what you missed last week. Last time, the ghouls finished the beautiful second-generation Plymouth GTX in seafoam turquoise. This time, the ghouls band together and take extra effort to document and preserve as much as they can while disassembling a pristine condition 1969 Dodge Daytona. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Right now I got this beautiful bronze 68 Charger RT in the shop and I'm actually gonna start working on the grill assembly. So what I do on the grill assembly is basically this one is in such beautiful condition, original condition, tear it all down into all the individual components so I'm just left with just the plastic part of the grill, bring it outside, uh, clean it up really good and uh, get it over to Will so he can get a uh, fresh coat of paint on it. As I'm tearing down this grill, I can kind of see, I mean, it's in beautiful original condition. The only thing it is, I mean, the car sat for a long time out in the field, so it's got some kind of grime on it, so that might be a little bit difficult to get off. It's kind of a waxy, uh, oily type of coating on there, so I don't know exactly what it is, but hopefully I can get a little purple power on it, get it cleaned up. I got the grill out back. I got it on a stand out there. I'm gonna actually do a little bit of power washing with it, but first I'm gonna get a little chemical on it with a brush, try to scrub a lot of that grime off of it, kind of work in between the fins and everything on the grill. Then you gotta be careful with these, cause I mean, it's 49 years old. It's plastic. The plastic they used back in the day is really brittle, you know, after all this time. So you gotta kind of, it's tedious work. You just gotta take your time and just keep scrubbing until I get it all clean. Finally got it all cleaned up, got it dried off. I'm gonna bring it over to Will, and then uh, Will take care of the, the finer details, all the paint work, all the scuffing, all the prep work, so it's in good hands. The unique thing about the 68 Dodge Charger grill is the actual uh, vertical bars actually have silver paint on them. And over the years, they get worn off. So I was kind of pointing out to Will that we need to make sure, you know, that whenever you paint that, that all those vertical bars have gotta be argent color, like the surround part of that grill as well. I've been working on the CUDA convertible. I had to go grab Mark. I ran into some problems of lining the door up to the quarter panel. Everything's one big step. I mean, sometimes you really don't know what needs to be done until you take that next step and start fitting things up. And in this case, I had to fit the doors. I had to have the quarters all the way welded in place to be able to realize that the pillar needed to be pushed forward about an inch and a half and out to the right hand side. George is really evolving as a technician. In the case of this CUDA, this was a real problem. The fact that we all missed that it had been in a prior accident and that's why our pillar was back. That's why we had to make some modifications, but he did the right thing. He stopped, he came, he got me, we went through it together, I explained to him how the physics of all that worked. He came out and he cut a big line down the whole entire quarter. I thought he was crazy. I think Mark really saved the day today by giving me a hand and showing me some things that I didn't know. I'm just really proud of the technician he's turning into. Back in the old days, a lot of butchering went on. So they could have re-sculptured that whole quarter panel and dog leg area and the, and the B pillar out of Bondo. But once you discover that there's a problem and that problem resides in the metal part of things, I'm not gonna repair something cosmetically while structurally it has a problem. I'm gonna button it up by finishing off the welds, knocking everything out. And I think Mark's out of here to go disassemble the Daytona. I got the grill back from Will. He did a fantastic job. I mean, the color's just spot on, and he actually went in and hand painted all those vertical edges. So I know it took him a lot of time. I know it's a really tedious work, but it looks amazing. He did a fantastic job. Careful. Okay. 
Okay, so nice. I just finished the cut and buff on Torino 70 Cornet. The car looks gorgeous, so we brought it over here for Dave to assemble. Careful. <laughs> so. <laughs> you okay? Oh, I just thought of a sequel to a movie. Which one? Driving Miss Lazy. <laughs> Adam gets it. Huh. Oh, God. Is there ever my job? Where Mark. else can a guy do stuff like this for a living? Oh. Was there ever going to be a time you let me drive this car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the only time you're going to drive that car. That's what I was thinking. This is probably the most valuable car I've done yet. You know, right around a million dollars. I know that when this car is done and is going down the road, Brett comes to pick it up, there's no chance in hell Mark is letting me drive it. So my opportunity was now. I had Georgia in the front of it, Adam behind it pushing it, and I got to simulate driving. So now I can officially say that I drove a million dollar car. I figured so this is the closest I was gonna get to driving it. It looks good. Thank you. You look kind of like Skipper from Gilligan's Island up there, a little bit. Was that? Was no. That... I mean, just, just the way that you're commanding your ship. Right? It looks good, William. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Welcome. Are you, you gonna drive it? And, you did a good job painting it. My question for you is, would you like to do the Bumblebee on this one? Decal? The V6, sorry, V8W. Um, I'm not interested in doing decals. V9W. I didn't even get it off the freaking I don't know what cable. the code is anymore. I give up. It was an easy color to paint. Came out beautiful. The clear coat looks great. Buffed out great. Uh, actually, everything from start to finish, the car went perfect. Mm. Good looking car. So now that this, the body's all wrapped up, I'll head to the booth. I got all the, the hood, deck lid, all the parts and pieces to get done. And then Dave can get this whole car assembled. And like I said, the car came out sharp and I can't wait to see it all done. So what's on the agenda for Dave here in the assembly room today is, of course, we got this beautiful 70 Hemi Cornet convertible, uh, 426 Hemi four speed, mind you. I got front grille assembly right here, front volants all built out, ready to go in the car. I got our convertible top that I actually got to tear completely apart, uh, restore detail all to perfection, and put into the car. So that's my goal. It's it's kind of a reach. I mean, this seems really easy, but all, all kinds of things can go wrong, and especially with this top. If I end up having to do paint work, uh, doing a lot of sandblasting or you know restoring parts, it could take quite some time. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that when I get it all torn apart, everything is looks beautiful like it should, and in good working condition, and the grill and everything goes in, you know, with no problem, so that's my agenda. On March 24th, 1970, 48 years ago today, Buddy Baker Jr. was the first person to go 200 miles an hour on a NASCAR track. He was driving a 69 Charger Daytona. Now, in order for those cars to compete at NASCAR, Dodge had to build 500, at least, of those cars. At the end of the day, they built 503. This is one of those cars. Coming up, Dave talks about the life of Walter Chrysler. Mark dives into the Dave Weiss books. And Will begins the final paint and buff of the super rare, one of two Hemi Coronet convertibles, hood and deck lid. In 1875, one of the legends of the car industry was born. Walter P. Chrysler was born in Wamego, Kansas. The third of four children, his father, Henry Chrysler, was a lifelong railroad engineer and moved their family at a young age. As a boy, Walter dreamed of becoming a railroad engineer just like his father. When Walter Chrysler was 17 years old, he apprenticed as a machinist for the railroad. And over the next 20 years, he held many jobs in the industry. In 1908, Walter Chrysler bought his first car, a locomobile that cost $5,000. On an annual salary of only $8,000, and before he even knew how to drive it, ever curious though, Walter took the car apart and put it back together again in order to learn everything about it. In 1911, Walter met Charles Nash, president of General Motors. Charles wanted to bring Chrysler on as the manager of the Buick plant in Michigan, a position Walter accepted and in just a few years had tripled production for Buick, making it one of the strongest car brands in the country. Walter Chrysler ultimately left Buick in 1919 and assumed control of the Maxwell Motor Company. 
turning the alien company around, he debuted his very own car in 1924, dubbed the Chrysler 6, at the New York Automobile Show. An amazing car by all accounts. It featured a revolutionary new six-cylinder high-compression engine with a seven-bearing crankshaft, a carburetor air cleaner, and a replaceable air filter. The car was available for less than $2,000 and was a huge hit, selling some 32,000 units that year. Later, Chrysler phased out the Maxwell name, purchased the Dodge Brothers Car Company, and introduced the Plymouth and DeSoto Marquis. Named in 1928 as Time Magazine's Man of the Year, Walter P. Chrysler had cemented a legacy that stands to this day and paved the way for the Mopar muscle cars we love today. I had my goals of parts I wanted to get put on the Coronet to this week, and then all of a sudden, Mark came out here, told me he wanted to go out and help him and Doug and Alyssa disassemble the 69 Dodge Daytona. And of course, I'm gonna go out there and disassemble the Dodge Daytona. I mean, that's uh, you know just an amazing car. And this way here, it gives me an actual idea of what I'm gonna be you know looking forward to putting the car together. So our little Daytona Charger, we're getting ready to disassemble this car. I will be doing the camera work, and they will be doing the blue collar work. But there's a lot of really interesting parts to this car that are documentation, not only for when we put the car back together again, but that we can share with other winged warriors out there who are doing these cars. So with that, I think we ought to start tearing the car apart. What do you think? I'm ready. Yeah. How many Daytonas have you taken apart? None. How many Daytona Chargers have you taken apart? None. One. It actually works out pretty good because uh, I'm still lacking the hood and the deck lid on the 70 Cornet. Still a lot of parts I wanted to put on there. So hopefully uh, the few days I spend out there disassembling the Daytona will have uh, the deck lid and the hood all installed in the car and I can get right back to it. Hey Mark, did yeah. you want to pull the backs off these seats so we can see if there's a build sheet in them yeah, before we... I, I was going to do that later after okay. we get them out. If you could just put them back to back. Sounds good. These little uh, plugs, these are from an original rust proofing company. When you bought a new car back in the old days, it's really not a lot different than today. So in the case of our Daytona Charger, somebody went in, signed all the paperwork, and they said, hey, how would you like to have the car rust proofed? That's what these little plugs are. They're a company, an aftermarket outside company, nothing to do with Dodge, that go through and drill these holes and put a, a product in there that keeps it from rusting internally on the insides of the panels. This car has little to no rust at all. You might be able to attribute the preservation of that metal to that extra money. It'd be interesting to see how much money he spent, but whatever it was, it was probably money in the bank when it comes to preserving this car. Uh, so one of the goals this week is I wanted to get the hood and deck lid painted for the coordinate so we didn't slow uh, Dave down in the put together process. a picture of what this whole thing looks like from the factory when this is bolted on into place. Like, I'll know more when we take it off, but I kind of like to see it in its natural habitat, if you will, to see, like, where did it rust inside there? Was there a lack of paint somewhere from the factory? And again, this whole front end was put on at a whole nother place, but I still want to know exactly what the footprint of that thing looked like. So I'm just, you can't have too many pictures. Even if you think you have too many pictures of something, you don't. Because this car is so original, that's why I want to document this stuff. If everybody that took one of these 503 cars apart, we could put a whole album together and see just how many variations there were of it. There's a build sheet. Oh. Check this out, Mark. Look at that. We got yep. a broadcast sheet. Well, a partial one. Yep, partial one. Looks this like is a little pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when you tear one of these apart. And look at all the mouse stuff. That's what happened yep. to the other half of it. Yep, it's okay, probably in there somewhere. Of that, I want to be able to document exactly where in that back seat it was when we found it. Give me a smile, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you're, gonna be Dave. you're gonna be famous when I'm done. There you go. Look at the springs, they're like new. I know. What a jewel. Yeah, look at this, guys. This is what we call gold, Jerry. This is gold. Banya, Seinfeld. We'll take this inside and very carefully take it out of there. The top half of the build sheet is gone. 
the top half is the one that has the VIN number, the schedule production date that associates it with that car. You see the word special order? That was at the bottom of those build sheets because this was not just an average car. This was going over to become a Daytona. There is an additional location for a broadcast sheet. This is interesting. Taped to the top of the back side of the glove box was a broadcast sheet on a lot of Hamtramck cars, not just the B bodies, but the E bodies as well. So hopefully we have another one. You never know. I, this is going to be surprising for the owner. He's going to be excited. And I'm not going to take it out here. I'm just going to let that thing set and we'll take it out in a more controlled environment. In 1971, which big block Mopar was not available in the E body, the Cuda and the Challenger? Was it the 383 High Performance N code, the 440 High Performance U code, or the 440 six barrel or six pack V code? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. Okay, ghouls, how'd you do? What is your thought on that? Which of the engines was not available on an E-body in 1971? The answer is the U-Code 440 High Performance. Now that was a single four barrel engine. One of the most steadfast engines Chrysler ever built and was around forever. But for some reason, in 71, you couldn't get it in an E-body. Now you could never get it after 71 because the big blocks were out of the picture on the E-bodies. But in 70, you could. You, we've seen us just do one last year, the, the Plum Crazy 444 speed. That was just a four barrel engine. But in 71, you could not get it. Now, interestingly, because Chrysler does strange things, you could not get a 444 barrel high performance engine in a Super B in 1970 or a Plymouth Roadrunner. Why? You get 383s, you get 446 barrels in 70 on both of those cars. You could even get a Hemi in it. But you couldn't get a 444 barrel. You should have known that. Get it, you, it's the U code. So I'm just gonna play the pizza. One of the things I want to take a picture of before they take this headliner down is exactly what it looked like from the factory. These again are a conversion car. And so when we were doing Tom's 69 Daytona, we didn't know exactly how the fitment was supposed to be. I always thought it was kind of weird the way it was shaped. But if you look in here, you can see that there's obviously a pattern goes down like that, then it drops straight. But there's a great example of what that looks like from the factory. That's what I want. Tons of pictures of stuff like that. So we got all the back seat out. Mark talked about the, the headliner, which is super unique. So it's really cool for me because I'm gonna be putting the car together. So I like to look at all the little screws and, and everything that's in there. So I know, you know, which ones uh, went in which place, you know, and like I noticed in some of the back areas, there's two different screws. So either the molding had fallen off at one time and he replaced the screws uh, and, you know, some of the ones that are original. So we'll document all that. So then when we go through the Dave Weiss books, along with his books, you know, and, and what we're seeing off an original car just really makes the assembly process that much easier and that much more accurate. Yeah, I love this. This is great. This is a unicorn car. It took a little longer than normal to get Trino's hood done. Uh, it's a big surface area and the hood, they kind of oil can, so you push a little bit and they kind of go up and down. So blocking it makes it extremely hard. So I had it in the booth, I had color on it, looked good, I thought, and then I kind of caught the right light, saw a few little waves in it. So I just re-blocked the whole entire hood, painted it, and the hood looks really good right now, so it's ready to start buffing. So the headlight doors are open. I want to show you some stuff to look for before we take it off. First thing is to realize that this whole nose cone was built out, assembled, and done, and then painted. And there's evidence of that right here. Look carefully at the headlight retaining ring. You see that paint on there? See the different areas of paint? 
That means all that was in place, and what the guys did was masked them off and then shot the car. But they didn't do a very good mask job. This almost looks like something Will did in his first couple years working for me. They call that undermasking. <laughs> it should have went all the way around the edge, and in this case, and all the way into here, but they actually looped it off a little bit early, and that's why you see that paint along there. The other things that are really cool and compelling about these are, take a look at these unique fasteners right here. These bolts that you see, they're very, very flat. These are unique. They're not reproducing these. They have to set flush, or when the headlight door goes down, it would actually hit them. That's why this is a really, really flush unit. It looks like they maybe have slipped a little bit. Probably at one time, these were up over this area a little bit more, and right now they've slipped in, because I see a gap right here that probably shouldn't be there. But I like to document all of that stuff so I can show the other people building them what got paint on them, what didn't. You see, even this stopper here, what you're looking at is this is the adjustable stopper, pretty crude. It's got a stationary nut welded to this angle bracket, and then it just uses a regular bolt. What bolt is that? We'll know when we get it apart and get it cleaned up, but that's important to know. Any bolt would work, but only one was the one that they were used. Now, it may be, because these were done by hand, the, the conversion might be 100 different bolts used, but good documentation to have, and that's the reason I do it. Stay tuned. Mark dives into Dave Weiss's books. Will installs the hood and deck lid on the super rare one of two Hemi Coronet convertible. And Mark and Dave finish disassembling the 1969 Dodge Daytona. All right. Well, hey guys. Today we're gonna to answer some common questions that you guys have about carburetors here at GYC. What we have right here is an aftermarket carburetor. This is a Carter AFB AVS style carburetor. This right here is an actual original style Carter AVS style carburetor that we removed from a car. And this right here is Harms remanufactured or reconditioned uh, Carter AVS style carburetor. Looking at the two, the original one, and this re, you know, remanufactured or rebuilt model, how beautiful they look. All the correct plating, all the correct screws, everything looks basically brand new, like you would just take this thing out of the box. But he actually starts with this. Probably 75% of all our carburetors that we do here come from Harms. And as you can see, this here is made to look OE, original equipment. He's got all the right numbers on there. You can see all the stampings on there, the number on the front. Uh, it's, it's very important if you have a numbers matching car, especially uh, a 440 Super Commando GTX, or whether it be a Hemi car and you have two carburetors on there, this is what you're gonna wanna run. Uh, this makes your car more valuable. By having that OE original equipment carburetor, if you wanna turn money, or if you're in one of those high class uh, auto, automotive shows, this is one thing they're really gonna look at and one thing they're really gonna key in on. Well, I hope that answers some of your questions about the carburetors that we use here at Graveyard Cars. So, uh, till next time, take care, you guys. So far, Will has handed off the recently finished and super valuable Hemi Coronet convertible to Dave to begin its assembly. Mark and Dave started the tedious process of documenting, preserving, and disassembling the 1969 Dodge Daytona. Now, Mark and Dave enter the final process of the Daytona's disassembly while Will prepares to install the Coronet's hood and deck lid. Uh, so one of the goals this week is I wanted to get the hood and deck lid painted for the coordinate so we didn't slow uh, Dave down in the put-together process. Painted them, came out great, got them buffed to perfection, and now we're going to put them on. Uh, the cars are always pre-fit before we do a final paint, so these cars at that point just go together easy. So it's mainly just go over there, bolt them on, a little tweak here or there, and they fall right into place. Okay, I'm going to go up a little bit, guys. Push that up. Please do. Is that good? Yep. Craig, look at you hitting that much. Oh. No, I did not hit anything. You didn't? No. That <laughs> wants to jump. Yeah, it does. George, you got to go up just a little bit higher, though. Perfect. No, I can go as high as you want, my friend. Oh, mine's got to go low. Okay, get yours done, then we'll do mine. Well, as soon as I get this started Try in the hole. That <laughs> is right in this edge. You know, I'm going to raise that.
What I'm doing right now is using these quarters to establish scale, like how wide is the gap between the fender and the hood before we take it off. We'll never know that again. We'll never know it. Right now, I just put these quarters in at the back. I have two quarters, and they are literally, I can't wedge them down in there. But I come to the front, and I can clearly put them both in there. So as I run it like this, I can feel it starting to get tighter and tighter. And right there is where it begins to sink in. Now, we'll probably line it up better. I just want to know that if at the end of the day, I can't get a better alignment, if I can't get a precision, perfect line, I can explain why. It was never meant to have it. It was never built to have it. I'm not going to cut this fender out and open it up so I have a wider gap at the front because it should be there. I wouldn't do that to a car. I mean, it's just a typical nasty old car that we get to take apart with dead animals and huge tarantulas that have dried up and died. And yeah, it's just, that's the magic of these old cars. So I think for the most part, we'll be able to just reuse all the parts. Uh, this is, this car's in incredible shape. I don't even know why we're restoring it. So my job today is just to try to keep everything as organized as I can so that when Dave comes to put the car back together, everything is together. We can just take out the pieces and clean them and put them back in the car. Put them in a, a, baggie? a baggie. Yeah, okay. you can just wrap it around the, okay. anything on the shifter. One of the most celebrated, imitated, but never duplicated engines on the planet today is the 426 Hemi. Now, Hemi is actually a contraction of the full word. True or false, Hemi is short for hemiplegia. Hemiplegia. The answer coming up after the break. All right, folks, what do you think on the Hemi, huh? What do you think? Hemiplegia, yay, nay, what do you think? Well, it's not hemiplegia. What kind of crazy talk is that? That, that talks about when somebody, the whole side of their body is like paralyzed or something. That's hemiplegia. It's hemispherical. How many times have I done? Most of you all are watching, right? You got it right, didn't you? You get it right? Did you get it right? <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Getting Wise with our friend Dave Weiss and his reference books. One of the parts I want to highlight right here are truly one of the things that usually is missing, and it's the alternator mounting bracket for the big blocks. This is for a non-air conditioning car. Start out, these are the kits that we buy through OER. They have every piece exact to the way it's supposed to be on the car, has a graph of exactly how it goes. You almost can't screw this up. And then we're gonna open the book and see how it's supposed to go together. We'll get her opened up. Looks like we have big block alternator mounting without air conditioning. If you look here, you've got the H. This is the lower mounting bolt that you can see. Measures 3 8 16 coarse thread, four and a quarter inches long from here to here. So four and a quarter inches, perfect. It uses a black phosphate washer, which you can see right here. The very unique head bolt right here with all the little slashes in it. You see it matches that even right down to the writing on the ends. If you go over to the spacer page, here you can see the longer spacer, which measures exactly two and three quarters. The shorter one that measures an inch and a quarter. Here you have the actual bracket itself that matches the one in the picture. The adjustment strap, which is over here. So if you turn it like that, and then actually pay note to the raised up area that is very consistent right here and here. So at the end of the day, you put that whole thing together and that holds the entire alternator mounting system in place on your 1967 and later big block Mopars without air conditioning. That is what we in the business refer to as getting wise. Welcome. There'll be more on this stuff down the road. Keep your thinking caps on. Hi. Ah, uh, did you? Check this out, boss. Come here, look at this. 
Somebody carved on the A pillar here. Looks like, I don't know if that's Vic or Bob. Something was here. Looks like Bob, huh? Yeah, probably is Bob. Bob Holler. Is that a W? It's a W, yeah, was here. You could see the was oh, it here. Is? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh man. no. I wonder what that you, means. You think I've that never was, heard of it. Yeah, I wonder if that was somebody a creative. That would be a great question for the guys down at Wing Warriors. That would Who be would scratch it all the way to the bare metal? Why wouldn't you just put a paint marker in there? I know. Well, he obviously knew it was going to be covered up by this. Is there anything on the inside of that? Nope, nothing. Somebody actually gouged their... Bob Holler was here. Yeah, looks like you took Bob a... Bob Holler, what are you doing, man? <laughs> that Daytona Charger. I know. That's a half million dollar car and you scratched your name in it. Yeah. The windshield's been replaced. Yeah. It's a LOF, I noticed on the other side. So it could be that some knucklehead did that. I yeah. guess it's possible. Yeah. That it's would... hard to imagine, because if I came up and somebody was gouging their name in my car, <laughs> After putting Maybe the last in. windshield they put in <laughs> yeah, no on this kidding. earth. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. You got it. Okay. Great. Boy, that's awful original right there. Oh, look at that uh, Dave and Doug are doing really good on the disassembly of the Daytona. They've got the engine on the top side completely disconnected. So everything now that needs to come apart so that drivetrain can come out is on the bottom side of the car. So we have to lift it up in the air to do that. The interior is out of the car. Everything that's left is mostly on the bottom side of the car. Before we do it, I want to get the rear wing off, so let's rock it. Oh, God, you are dirty. Mm. All right, you got your tire and pulled it over a little bit. That one's not. And that one is also. Okay, Ready? Go down so slow. Yeah, this is so close. Yeah, dude, fudge, yes it is. I've got about a quarter of an inch now. Cool. Keep going. Easy, Tiger. Nope. Are you hitting? No, it's not, but it's not far from it. I'm way farther back on that hinge than what you are. Slow. I, I, I. OK. It wants to catch on that cowl, dude. Yes, it does. It's like right there. It says, I want a piece of that. Man, I don't want to even slide. There. Finally, it moved all at once. OK. Now I know I'm far enough away from the cowl. Right. It's not even going to come close. Oh, yeah. Keep going. Yep. Actually, it's not bad right where <laughs> no. it's at on my side. Keep going. Your, on the other hand, are way out there. I'm top to out. So the hinges are cocked? They got to be. Have to bring them up a little All bit. All right, so you're good? Yeah, I can get it from there. Cool. Color matches. We're, we're done. So now that Craig and I got the hood on and the deck lid ready to go for Dave, as soon as he's done with Daytona, he's right back to work on it. OK, gentlemen, how are we doing back here? Oh, we're doing great. Oh, yeah. Coming off? Yeah. Nice. About time. It owes me this one. There you go. I yeah. have no doubt after that last one. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they put an extra washer on there. They got a captive, and then they had an extra. Yeah, I don't know why they would do that, but yeah, extra. See, and I bet a lot of people don't know that, but you can clearly tell by the footprint that this and this once sat over here like this. 
Yeah, I wonder how many people know about that. That's the kind of stuff that's really interesting. Now, again, our friends down at Wing Warriors, they'll know that stuff far better than I do. Oh, look under your side. Oh, yeah. Oh. What was going on in there? What is it? Oh, oh mousy. I don't know if he got well, inside of that. how did he get in there? I think it's just the fiberglass or the oh, aluminum. Oh, it's the electrolysis from the aluminum. Let's see here. Doug? Sure could be. Yeah, look at that. It just kind of. Boy, it's thick. Yeah, it just kind of gets that moisture. We should have that dent. Yeah, maybe. Huh? Yeah. It wouldn't hurt that. I wouldn't want to blast it. We'd have it dip yeah. and treat it. That's cool. Take a look at these vacuum lines. You can tell a reproduction vacuum line a mile away because they're smooth. Take a nice close look at this vacuum line. If you look, you can see ribs in there. It's smooth over here, but you have those ribs right across there. That's an original hose. Same thing on the smaller ones. See the multi-ribs right through here? Now the backside again is smooth, but when you hold that out there, you go at a car show and you take a look, if it doesn't have those ribs in it, then it's a reproduction. If these are nice, we'll clean these up and reuse them. Ready, Mark? <coughs> Top go four. For it. Andre, go for it. Hey, you're cheating. You're using a light. You're not supposed to use a light. Really? Yeah. No one told me that. Helen Keller style. <laughs> How you look there, Doug? Great. Looks good. Go right on Great. Top of this bed. Great. All right, back to business. Okay, uh, nice. Will's got my hood on, my deck lid on, so I can get knocking it out. Let's do this. Back to the office, as I would say, my nice clean assembly room. So I started working back on the 70 Cornet uh, Hemi car, and of course I got those beautiful hood scoops on there. I got the hood pins on there, the hood pin shafts and everything, got that RT emblem on there. Got my headlight assemblies on there, so all I'm lacking now is to put that beautiful grill assembly in and the front gravel pan. But before I put that on, I actually brought the top down. Doug gave me a hand, and so I'm gonna actually tear into this top. So I wanna make sure there's no issues in here. If I have to have Will paint it, I kinda wanna get a jump on that before I jump back over to there. So this is what I'm gonna be working on right now. The top was actually perfect, it was just wrong. This top in particular is a pinpoint. The reason they call it a pinpoint is if you look at the texturing, it looks like you took a pin and just put a bunch of holes in it. So they call this a pinpoint. And this car actually is supposed to have a crushed vinyl top. And a crushed vinyl is actually, looks like a vinyl top. It's got a grain pattern to it, like a regular vinyl top would on a car, but it's actually for a convertible top. So 1970 takes a crushed vinyl, and I believe in 67 is when they used this pinpoint. So these are a little stronger, a little more durable. So every time you saw a uh, convertible get a, you know, a new top put on it, they usually went with a pinpoint. But we want to put this all back to a factory original OE. And so we're going to go back to the crushed. But what I'm going to do is the back window panel is the same on whether the top is a pinpoint or a crushed. So I'm actually going to save this back window, the zipper and everything, 
is in perfect condition. The canvas is in great condition. So I'm actually going to detach the, the back window from that and then work on removing the top from the top frame. So that's what we're doing right now. Turn apart the convertible top on this car, and, and it, so far it's going smooth. Uh, it's really nice having an actual, you know, survivor car. This car was restored back in the, I guess, late 70s, so the top is fairly new, and it was, the car was always taken care of, so it's, it's coming apart really easily. So the frame and everything is in almost perfect condition. I'm just gonna have Will scuff it, put a nice, you know, clean coat of paint on it, just in the areas that are visible, and uh, put it right back into the car. Now that the top's all torn apart, I'm just gonna put it up on a paint rack and send it over to Will, have him do his thing, uh, get a nice coat of paint on it. It's got a couple little dings and dents on it he's gonna address, uh, get a nice fresh coat of paint. Then I'll get it back and put it in the car and start to plumb it out. Uh, Dave's got the top completely tore apart. Uh, he brought it over to me on a stand. Looks amazing already, but it still needs to be freshened up because you see parts of it. So uh, we got it hanging up there. I went through, sanded it out, fixed a couple of dings, and like I said, it was really nice to begin with. Uh, painted it black, and then I clear coated it with a semi-flat clear. Now that it's all painted and 100% dry, I'm gonna roll it back to Dave so he can get going. Uh, Will got the paint job all done on the top. Uh, he brought it in, it looks fantastic. All he did was mainly hit the areas that are mainly visible. There's still a little bit of glue and stuff on there that I'll actually take off once I get the top in place uh, to kind of get it prepared for Larry uh, to actually install the new top. But it looks great, can't wait to get it in the car. Uh, you know, all in all, it was a great week. I got all my tasks done. I got all my little odds and ends done. All over to Dave so I can move on. I would have liked to have gotten further on West uh, 69 GTX, but I didn't. But next week's a new week. I'm going to hit it hot and heavy, and we should be good to go. All in all, it's been a great week. Very productive. I mean, considering that I actually had to go and help uh, disassemble the 69 Daytona, which I'm not complaining, was awesome. I learned so much about that car. Took a lot of cool pictures. So it's just going to help me out in the assembly process of that car. So now, Back to the Cornette, you know, I got a lot of stuff done. I got the scoops on, got the air grabber system on there. I mean, super cool. Got the convertible top in. So now next week, I'm gonna focus on getting that front end built out and uh, just keep plugging away. We had a great week, wouldn't you say? Cousin Dougie here, by the way. Cousin Dougie, for those of you who have not met him. Strange little man. <laughs> I think we had a good week. You yes. think we had a good week? Yes, we did. Doug thinks we had a good week too. We got to disassemble what? A uh, 70 Charger. The Daytona? Yeah, they still, they're the 69s, but yeah. 69 Daytona the 69, Charger? Yeah, because they didn't do it in 70. But yes, the 69 Charger Daytona, that's right. How many did they build of those? 503. Beautiful work. That's my man coming along nicely right there. Ooh. That, to me, was one of the funnest things that I've got to do in a long time. I do document a lot of cars. I photograph a lot of cars. There's so many things on that meant something to me because we had done that other Daytona. And when it came in, it was a basket case. We had nothing. So, hmm. so that's what I've learned about. Document, document, document. It's the strangest little thing, like the headliner, all the way down to the, the octagon or, yeah, I think hexagon? Stop sign, little shape grill pieces. Did you see the little, the finite little holes in the front grill that I pointed out? No, you didn't catch that. <laughs> Dave's been working really hard on our 1970 Coronet RT convertible. Now that, you're talking about two cars ever built with a 426 Hemi, a convertible and a four speed. And this is the only one left. This is the only one known to exist. So you're down there in the rare rares. Anything you'd like to say to the crowd before we sign off, before we say anything, before we head out of here? Yes, I'm looking forward to, uh seeing the GTX completed for Torino. Oh, we did. We did? That was two years ago. I'm sorry. It's where, okay. Where am I? Been a hard week. <laughs> <laughs> where am I? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs>